Welcome to Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. Are you hungry to hear more about our beautiful Savior Jesus? Well, the Bible declares that grace and peace are multiplied to us in the knowledge of Jesus. Join me for revelatory teaching, interviews with leaders in the body of Christ, and testimonies of God's goodness in your life. Thanks for joining the conversation to reveal more of Jesus to a hurting world today. And it goes on to say in verse 21 that he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that's the crux of it right there, is that no man will be justified before the eyes of a holy God. The only hope, the only righteousness there is, is Christ's righteousness. But before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our Christina Prayer Ministry sponsors who help support the mission to unite the body of Christ and fulfill the Great Commission with love. A big shout out to Gopher Ministries who provides all of our equipment for our gospel events. Davis Financial Services who does all of our financial accounting. Harvest Family Network through which I am licensed and ordained and Life Changing Productions, who helps put together evangelistic events to reach our city for Jesus. If you or your organization are interested in becoming a CPM sponsor, you can find out more information on our website at ChristinaPereira.org. Do you have a loved one special occasion coming up and don't know what to get them? Well, now you can sponsor an episode of Revealing Jesus in their name. And you can give them a special dedication message read on air. It makes a great gift. To find out more information, just go to christinaperreira.org slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I am your host, Christina, and I'm so excited to have you with me here today. I hope and I pray that you are doing well right where you are, enjoying the continuously flowing favor of grace, pouring from our beautiful Savior and Father in heaven. I've got a great show for you today. I have an amazing leader in the body of Christ with me today. He is a Global Awakening Associate Evangelist, and he is the author of Every Day of Victory, Practical Weapons to Fight, Stand, and Live Free. I have with me here today, William Wood. William, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Christina. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you so much for being here with me today. You know, I have tremendous respect for Global Awakening and and all that they do. And I've loved reading through your book. I think it's a good book to help people fight and stay free. I told our listeners a little bit about you. Can you share something maybe personal with them just to help get to know you? Well, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about me is you know, when I'm not ministering, you know, I love to go hiking. Mm-hmm. And where I live here in Pennsylvania, I live close to the, the Appalachian Trail. So there's always some kind of trail or something that I can go down just to get away you know, from life and to get away from people <laughs> and just get with God because we all need that time of refreshing for sure. Mm-hmm. I love that. There's something so beautiful about being out in nature and being reminded of the bigness of God. I absolutely love that. Absolutely. When you're out in creation, it's obvious there's a creator. Mm-hmm. And you really gain a greater appreciation just for who he is when you're just out in creation, just away from the noise, away from everything, away from cell phones, TVs, and just complete peace and silence. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I think noise is overrated. I guess just recently for the last few years, I've started driving in the car with nothing, which is just unheard of for me because there's always worship music or something playing. But sometimes peace and quiet is just such a beautiful thing. Because I'm really an introvert by my personality, which is funny because God has called me to preach, you know, because being an introvert, I mean, I love peace and quiet. I love silence and I love those times that I get just to go off and just be with the Lord and there's nothing around us. Even if you think about it in the life that we live now in the world, like you mentioned, there's so much noise all around us as we kind of get conditioned to almost having to have it just to be at peace. Mm-hmm. But when we 
get those things out of our heart and out of our life and out of our mind and just get with the Lord. And then we can really focus on who he is and his presence. Then we really discover what true peace is. And that's the presence of God. Mm-hmm. I love that so much. I love that you said that because I think there's only some things that we can get from being in that silence with him. Since this is revealing Jesus, I have to ask you how you met our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Well, it's funny that you asked me that question because today is my spiritual birthday, May 31st, and Mm -hmm. I'm celebrating 18 years of walking with the Lord. The way I look at it, I'm still a teenager. I can't wait to grow up and (laughs) and see what it's going to be like when I'm a full adult walking with Jesus because I'm looking at all the things he's done in my life and then. This past 18 years has just been tremendous, you know, but my story really starts in May of 2005 in the state of Alabama. At that time, I was a self-professed atheist. I was also an alcoholic, drug addict, and the way that I came to the Lord was overdose on drugs. I was walking along the side of the road. I had been up for about six days on methamphetamine and different types of drugs without any sleep, no sleep wow. at all days. And so once you stay awake that long, hallucinations begin, just different things begin to happen in your body. Well, when I overdosed on drugs, I was walking alongside the road and I fell into the highway and a car sideswipes me, knocks me down this ravine, about 40 yards down this ravine. When I hit the bottom, it knocked me out completely. And so when I came back to, I woke up, I was in a hospital room, there's doctors standing over me and they were trying to pump drugs and stuff, get things out of my system. And the doctor looked at me and said, William, your kidneys have completely failed and your liver is failing. Matter of fact, if your liver fails, you're probably going to die. And I remember I just closed my eyes and I went back to sleep. And I don't know how many days I was actually out. It was several days because the next time I wake up, I'm two hours away in a different hospital in intensive care. And I looked at myself and I looked up to all these different machines and they're just trying to keep me alive at this point. They had me on a kidney donor list because both my kidneys had failed. And every day the doctor would come in and say, William, if your liver fails, you're going to die. There's really not much we can do, do for you at this point. And because I was an atheist, I wasn't praying for God to come help me. I wasn't crying out to Jesus or anything like that. But I would have this thought every single night before I went to sleep. And the thought was simply this. I hope I wake up and see tomorrow. That was pretty much the hope of my life at 20. Mm -hmm. And after two weeks of being in intensive care, I remember having that thought. And every time I would have that thought, I would close my eyes and go to sleep. This time, as soon as I was thinking this, a bright light forms right in front of my hospital bed. And I began to look at this light. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger to us, like the size of a doorway or pathway. And as I'm looking at the slide, I begin to see a figure of a man walking toward me through the slide. And within just a few seconds, he steps through this light into the hospital room where I'm laying. And this power just hits my body. And I begin to vibrate and shake under this power. Uh, but at the same time, there was so much love accompanying with this gentleman. Like, whoever he was, I knew he wasn't there to hurt me. Mm-hmm. And so he starts walking to the foot of my bed. He's not saying anything to me. And to be honest with you, I thought I was having another trip on mushrooms or a flashback on my drugs that I've been doing or hallucination. I was just thinking it was something of that nature Mm. at first, you know. But when he walked right to the foot of my bed, he didn't say anything to me. He turned like he was leaving the room, but he didn't. He sits down on the floor. And when he sits down on the floor, the wall opens up. And when I say that I'm seeing this, this is not a figment of my imagination. I'm seeing this with my natural eyes. The wall completely opens up. A river of water starts flowing from the wall into the room where this man is sitting, right in front of where he's sitting. And he sticks his arms in this water, begins to wash his arms and to clean himself. And an audible voice speaks to me. An audible voice says, the waters that you see will purify and cleanse you if you receive Jesus the Christ as Lord and Savior. And as soon as I heard this voice, I just scream out into the hospital room, yes. And all of a sudden, that power that was on my body, it literally went inside of me, which looking back now, I know that I was being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I could literally feel my organs being just trembling under this power. Well, 
it gets so intense, it knocks me out. I wake up the next day, about 12, 13 hours later, the doctors are shaking me and it's, William, wake up, wake up, wake up. So I wake up and the doctor said, listen, we've been doing tests on you for the past 10 hours. Not only are your kidneys better, not only is your liver better, but it's as if you've never done drugs before in your life. You, matter of fact, you have new organs inside of you. Wow. <laughs> That is so, so amazing. And so my first experience just with Jesus was that. He appeared to me himself. He sp spoke to me, delivered me out of my drugs, delivered me out of my addiction, delivered me out of my brokenness, and also healed my physical body and restored it. And so I went into that hospital an atheist, but I came out of that hospital a son. Amen. Oh, my goodness. That's an amazing story, William. Thank you so much for sharing that. Wow. I love to share my story. So. Oh, I love that. You know, there's something so unique about each one of our testimonies. It reveals an aspect of Jesus that this world wouldn't otherwise see manifested through each one of our lives. And God is so good. And, and I fully believe that he will absolutely do whatever it takes to reach us where we are, just like he did for you. Amen. And it's, it's a go to your point that you're making there. You know, if you, if you look at every individual's life, I always say it this way every person is born an original, which means every single one of us carries an aspect of the nature of God that only we can reveal in the way that He has designed us to be. And when we desire to be somebody else, in a sense, it's kind of a sin against our own design. Yeah. You know, in your book, you talked about ways that the enemy kind of deceives us and it brings up kind of that chapter that you talked about on how uh, satan tries to distort god's image in us and how it leads to darkness in the world i think that's a perfect segue can you talk about that when you look in genesis 1 um, 26 there it says that god created man in his image well when you look at that word image it, it doesn't just simply mean resemblance it actually means to be a representation. Mm -hmm. So you can even say it this way. God formed us in his image to be an exact representation of who he is. Well, who did Satan want to be? He wanted to be God. Mm -hmm. But yet God formed man in his image. Satan wasn't formed in God's image. And so one of the things that he wanted to do is that he wanted to distort the image that we were created in because if he couldn't be God, then what he wanted to do was pervert the image and distort that image that we were created to represent in a sense to kind of undermine the creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I know in my walk as a believer, some of the greatest areas that I've had to come out of agreement with the enemy with were over who I was. And I think as a lot of Christians out there can relate to that, our identity is so important because just as you mentioned, each one of us are made in the image of God. And so if the enemy can get us to agree with his point of view of how he sees us, he can trap us. You know, the Lord said something to me very powerful one time. He said, don't let anybody but me paint you. I'm a creative person and I love to paint. And he said, only I get to paint you as your creator. Can you talk about how important our identity is and how we can come out of agreement with those places where the enemy tries to destroy us? Well, when you look at the way the enemy attacks us, it's really just two categories that he comes against us with, and that's deception and temptation. And the reason I say they're categories is because he kind of manifest them in different aspects and different forms, but it really comes down to these two areas of deception and temptation. Well, what is the power of deception? It's the ignorance of truth. You know, Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. John chapter right. eight, verse 32 says, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. So by that context, the truth we don't know is what's keeping us bound. And so when we don't have the truth of who we are in Christ and who Christ is inside of us, then that opens us up to be deceived or to be manipulated by the enemy to distort the image of the one that we were created in. And that second category that the enemy comes against us with is temptation. We maybe think, well, how does the enemy tempt us? 
and he's very subtle in the way that he does this. And the way I like to articulate it is this, is that he projects his own sinful nature upon us, hoping that we would come into agreement with his desires. For instance, he'll project lust upon us. And we begin to feel that lust or feel that anxiety or fear, or whatever it is. As soon as we take ownership of it, we actually empower his desires to become our desires. For instance, when a spirit of fear comes against you, the reason you experience fear is because that spirit itself is afraid. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you take ownership of it, you empower that spirit's fear to become your fear. And so these are really the two categories or two areas that he comes against us with. Wow. Yes. And, you know, immediately when you said project, my mind went back to this place in your book where you talked about you had this moment in your life where this prophetic person came to your church and gave you a prophetic word, but it was not laced with the power of God. It was laced with the power of the enemy. Can you talk about that and just give a good example? That's a good example of that. Well, it was actually, I believe at the time, it was the first prophetic word that I ever received. And so I was excited to kind of experience what that was going to be like. And this person came to our church and, you know, they were calling out people. They're giving words over them. And then they get to me. And at that time, I've been saved probably three months. And to be honest with you, I was living pure. I was living holy. I was living righteous. Like I just become a new creation in Christ. And I was just having a good time with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Well, this person, they look over at me and says, will, will you stand up? And so I stand up and they say, well, I just see uh, darkness all over you. I see lust in your heart. I see deception in your heart and you need to get in the word of God. And well, it was complete opposite of everything that what I was really experiencing, I believe what took place was that person was seeing through the lens of my history and not through the lens of my destiny. In other words, they were receiving a word of knowledge of the things that I've been through, but misapplied it in a sense of thinking that I was still going through that when reality was that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But what it did do for me is it caused me to go home and become highly introspective. Mm -hmm. And I always say it this way, introspection is the counterfeit to the role of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to let the Holy Spirit take us inward to address the things that he wants to address. Because if we try to do it on our own, we just simply end up doing more damage to our heart and our mind. Because the reality is, if any of us go inward, we're going to find things wrong with us. You know, you don't overcome, because when you identify the truth, by default, it destroys and breaks the lies. Mm -hmm. You know, what the Lord taught me in that season, when I was trying to go inward and just identify all the lies and false beliefs about my life. He was showing me that you don't overcome those lies and false beliefs by trying to identify that. You overcome them by identifying truth. By default, those false beliefs and lies are broken off of your mind and your heart. Jesus longs to see you prosper in every area of your life. Do you need increased health, wholeness, and freedom? Are you hitting walls when you try to pursue it? I've got a great resource for you, Healing Rain from author and international speaker Sue Detweiler, full of incredible testimonies, discussion questions, and prayers. This biblical guide points you to the words, actions, and miracles of Jesus. You will be empowered to trust His presence so you can overcome trauma and destructive thoughts open your heart to spiritual encounters with him and receive the power of his blood to heal every area of your life. And just for being a Revealing Jesus listener, you get 40% off and free shipping on Healing Rain at bakerbookhouse.com using the promo code REVEALINGJESUS. Pick up a copy today and be on your way to life and life more abundantly. Just head to the link in the show notes. Amen. That is so good, William. You know, in my relationship with the Lord, the Lord has always dealt with me based on who I am in Christ. He's never pointed me to my past or my failures or any of those things. When he points us to what Jesus has done for us, those are those things that we replace and that causes all of those lies to fall off. That's so good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let's talk about standing in the armor of God and how we fight those lies with new covenant truth. 
Can you give our listeners some key points that they can fight with new covenant truth? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 says, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So it is our weapon of warfare. You know, it's what we fight our battles with, and it's what we use to dismantle the lies or the false beliefs that the enemy is coming against us. But one thing you'll notice in Ephesians 6, when it talks about putting on the armor of God, that it's actually our responsibility to put it on. God supplies it to us, but it's our responsibility to apply it to our life. And that's an understanding I think people miss a lot of times is that the will of God is seeking the will of man so that the will of God can be fully accomplished through our life. He's not going to do things for us. He wants to do things through us. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to these battles and standing, he provides, but we are the one that appropriates what he provides. He gives us everything that we need to walk in victory, to walk in freedom, but it's our responsibility to actually apply those things to our life. You can also compare it to what James says in James chapter one. It says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but also be a doer of the word. So deceiving yourself. And so even though we have knowledge of things, if we don't apply that knowledge to our life, we live by self-deception. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of times this knowledge isn't the issue. It's just simply the application of that knowledge is the issue because I can't tell you how many people I'm praying for, ministering with, and I begin to counsel them and they'll say something like this. Well, William, I already know that. Well, I'm thinking, well, since you already know that, why are you not living in the reality of that? Well, it's because they haven't applied that truth to their life. And so for me to stand doesn't mean that I'm sitting back and relaxing. It doesn't mean I'm standing still, right? Mm -hmm. It means that I'm moving forward. You can even look at James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Well, that word re resist means to actively stand against. That means you're moving forward in a sense. You're actively fighting against the devil. Because I even want to say it this way. You know, what you oppose, you can resist. And if you don't oppose the devil, you cannot resist the devil. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Yeah. We can't come against something that we're in agreement with. You know, right. I've, I've encountered demons before, and you can't cast something out that you don't have authority over. If you're in agreement with something, they're just going to laugh at you. Well, exactly. You know, even if you look at Jesus in his 40 days in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, you'll notice several things. One of the first things that you'll notice is that there's no recorded miracles that Jesus performed until after he came out of that season. Mm -hmm. But you also notice that it was in that season, in that 48 days, where he confronted and defeated Satan in private before his public ministry began. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, whatever's defeating me in private will usurp my authority in public. And so it was imperative for Jesus to confront Satan in private and defeat him so that he can actually stand in authority over him in public. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting. People always want to know where that authority comes from, and it comes from exactly what you just said, applying the word of God to your life and defeating those things in private, knowing who you are in Christ and knowing what new covenant truth is. I was so excited to read in your book, you started talking about how we are dead to the law and alive to God. And I got so excited because I'm a new covenant preacher and teacher. And if people don't realize how Jesus has defeated the enemy, how he has disarmed principalities and powers by removing the handwriting stand and standards that were written against us and fulfilling it himself, how now the enemy cannot come at us with any condemnation. Let's talk about that because that truth alone will equip many, many believers. Well, absolutely. And if you look around at Christianity today, a lot of people still live with a mixture of covenants. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a modern day Judaizers that Paul was dealing with in Galatians. People try to mix law and grace. Well, Romans chapter 11, verse 6 is, basically says this, is either going to be on the basis of grace without works or is it going to be on the basis of works without grace, but it cannot and will never be on the combination of the two. Amen. So if you just look at this the law mentality, just the law mentality in general, you know, you base your relationship on your performance. 
But when you base your relationship on your performance, it will manifest itself into two forms in your life, a sin consciousness or self-righteousness. The sin consciousness comes because under the old covenant law, it shows you the standard of righteousness, but it doesn't have the power within itself to produce righteousness. So therefore, it can only expose our unrighteousness. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says, under the law comes the knowledge of sin. So it makes you become aware, oh, I'm a sinner. And it kind of holds you under that reality that you're a sinner, that you fall short, which is good because it leads you to the point that, hey, I need us, I need saving. Right? That's right. That's right. But it also produces a self-righteousness. The issue is the only way that you can become self-righteous is if you begin to categorize sin into acceptable and non-acceptable. Mm-hmm. For instance, someone may look at it and say, you know what, that's an unacceptable sin, but yet that same person will gossip about other believers and will think anything about that. Well, from God's standpoint, sin is sin, and there are no categories of sin, and there is no acceptable sin in the eyes of God. First John chapter 1, verse 8, I believe it is, it says, if anybody confesses that they are without sin, they're a liar, and the truth isn't even in them. And so that's why Jesus had to come to the cross, because under the old covenant law, Sin was imputed unto us. That's why there was a sacrificial system. But the issue was the blood of bulls and goats could not take away the sin, our sins. And so under the old covenant law, sin was imputed unto us. But under new covenant grace, sin has been imputed unto Christ. And so under the old covenant law, we get what we deserve. But under new covenant grace, we get what Christ deserves. Mm-hmm. And when I say that a lot of times, people struggle with that. But You have to come to those conclusions when you allow the Bible to determine what you believe. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling to the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against them. (laughs) And it goes on to say in verse 21 that he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that's the crux of it right there is that no man will be justified before the eyes of a holy God. The only hope, the only righteousness there is, is Christ's righteousness. That's exactly right. You know, Romans 3, verse 19 is very clear that no person will be justified before God in the eye, through the eyes of God, but according to the law, according to works. And so when I have this works relationship with God and I based it on my performance, as long as I'm doing well, I feel like God loves me. But the moment I mess up, I mm-hmm. feel like, well, God's going to fly off from me for two weeks. And now I got to fast and pray until the woo his presence back. And I always tell people, I say, well, if Jesus was that sensitive, he wouldn't have died for your sins in the first place. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. I mean, the Bible actually says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While they were spitting on him, he died for them. Come on. You know, there's a term that people would say in Alabama right after I got saved. I would hear Christians say this all the time, and they would say it like it's biblical, but it's not. And they would say, well, God only helps those who help themselves. And oh. I got to think, well, Romans 5 verse 6 says, while we were yet helpless. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I was like, well, that undermines the whole point of him being a savior. If God only helped those who helped themselves, wouldn't nobody be saved in the first place. That's the whole right. fact that we needed a savior was the point that we couldn't help ourselves. (laughs) That's right. That was the whole point of the law being given was to show up our sinful failure to keep his holy standards. And the Bible even says that those who are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law, not those who break the law. If you're working to keep the law, you're under its curse. And the, the bad news is, is that If you're under the law, you're not sacrificing annually the blood of bulls and goats. So you're just remaining in your sin. Like, you don't even have that. So Jesus is your only hope. That's exactly right. You know, that's why people have these blessing and cursing mentality. It's the Deuteronomy 28 mentality. If you do these things, these blessings shall come upon you. But if you don't, (laughs) but all these curses. And so that's why when people have a law mentality, they make a mistake, and they mess up, they feel like, well, God's probably going to put cancer on me now to teach me a lesson or whatever. You come up with these weird things, not realizing you know, Jesus has completely set you free from the curse of the law. 
In James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you're missing one aspect of it, you're guilty of a, of a law. There's 613 laws <laughs> that, you have to, that you have to keep. And so that was the whole purpose of the law was to expose you are a sinner and you are in need of a savior. It is to lead. It was a tutor that led you to the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you put this heavy yoke on the burden of the necks of the people and you do nothing. You don't even lift a finger to help them. That was the purpose of the law. Yep. That's exactly it right there. I'm so thankful for Jesus. But see, you have to know these things. If you are going to wage spiritual warfare in your life, you have to know this so that you can enforce the victory that Christ has already given you. Is there anything burning on your heart that you'd like to say directly to our listeners, William? Well, the number one thing that's always burning on my heart, it's been burning on my heart for 18 years now, and that is connect people to the truth of what Christ has done for them and the magnitude of what he has done for them. So whoever is listening right now, I just want you to close your eyes. Now I just want you to allow the word of truth to just settle in your heart, you know, that he made him who knew no sin to become sin on your behalf so that you might become the righteousness of God through him, that you are able to come before the throne of his grace boldly because you stand before the Father as Jesus stands before the Father. When he looks at you, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees a person that's righteous and holy and pure. And so I just speak right now against every false person belief or lie that's coming against the heart or the mind of the people to undermine that truth. I command every lying voice to be silenced in the name of Jesus. And I just plead the blood of Christ from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet as a holy separation between them and every lying spirit right now. Jesus' mighty name. So Holy Spirit has come upon them with a fresh release of your spirit, a fresh impartation of your spirit, Lord an activation of gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, William. I so appreciate that. You know, I too love to see people strong and bold for the kingdom. So thank you for that. Amen. Well, thank you for inviting me to share and to pray for the people. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, I hope and pray today's episode has blessed you. I will have links from today's podcast and resources in the show notes on cpnshows.com under Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira or wherever you get your podcasts. There you'll find additional resources to connect with us and our special guest, William Wood. And don't forget to pick up a copy of his new book, Every Day a Victory, Practical Weapons to Fight, Stand, and Live Free. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I hope today's episode has blessed you. Please subscribe, share it with your friends, and don't forget to sign up for our ministry mailing list for more encouraging content about our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Just text JESUS to 1-833-815-7778. That's 1-833-815-7778. Seven 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 eight, And of course, it's your turn now to join the conversation. Send me your burning questions, leaders you would like to hear from in the body of Christ, your testimonies, and more. Just click join the conversation in the show notes. And for more information about our ministry, visit us at ChristinaPereira.org. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless.